Oh no, it's 10.15. You want me to really start? Yeah, yeah, tell them who we are. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> come on, get on with it. Time no, is precious. No, no, we are happy that you're all here and we're happy that both of you are here because we're talking, I think, about one of the most important topics from a human perspective mm -hmm. at the moment in our industry. And um, Kelly, I think it's amazing that you've put yourself in the forefront to, to make this happen. Thank Don't you. forget, she also is a Master 500 GT Captain's Crew Award winner. <laughs> last year. Uh, well ah, thank you. Uh, and she gave this amazing speech when she and where she said like where she said where she came from, how she fought to get where she got to, mm -hmm. and I think that was the inspiration for all this. So to the both of you, thank you so much for doing this today, and enjoy. And we're very happy thank to you. have you. Thank you. You know, I had I I I have my notes here in front of me. We rehearsed how we were going to start this, and it, that is all out the window because. <laughs> The room is full. <laughs> and I'm just up here going, oh my God, all these people came to listen to Emma and I babble on for two hours. <laughs> no, I want to I wanna jump straight in because like Anna said, this is such a hot topic right now. And um, there's, it, it, yeah, it's some of the sticky stuff um, in this industry. And even just yesterday at the show, I was sitting down actually with a crew agent and we were talking about the event and, and were they coming and everything that I had going on in, at the show this week. And she said to me, yeah, I had to do a video of a stew the other day, walking towards the camera and walking away from the camera for the owner's rep. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's the appropriate response. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's normal. That's the only thing. Yeah. Uh, it, it, that's got to stop. So that's got to stop. My, my cell phone rang late last night, uh, forgetting that it was still daytime over on the other side of the pond. And um, it was a former crew member of mine. And I answered the phone. I uh, hadn't spoken to her a while. thought it was kind of odd that she was calling. And uh, I answered the phone and heard the panic in her voice. And I said, what's going on? And she says, she says I'm going to a hotel. And I said, why are you going to a hotel? She says, well, my engineer's creeping me out. And uh, he's been following me around the boat all night. He's been out drinking. And she goes, well, I'm, I'm, I'm worried. And I said, well, and she says, do you think I should go to the hotel? And I said, well, if you think you need to go to the hotel, you need to go to the hotel. And uh, I talked to her a little bit more last night. And come to find out, this fellow's got a history and somehow has slipped through the cracks, uh, getting hi through the hiring progress, a boat that normally has a pretty hi rigorous hiring pro prog uh, uh, process. And turns out that he has a former, a former history of sexual harassment. And so it's, it's working out just over last night and yesterday that he will be dismissed from the boat. And the gut feeling that I think she had was probably pretty right. Mm -hmm. And so things like this keep occurring in the, in the business and I keep hearing, hearing stories over and over and people reaching out to me on Instagram that I don't even know, that I've never spoken to a day in my life, asking me what do I do about this situation, telling me that their captain roughed them up for something that so silly as, as well I was up on the flybridge underway and he yelled at me because I turned the radar on and said that, the, that there was full visibility, clear skies, calm seas. What an incompetent first officer I am because I turned the radar on. And she says, I'm afraid to say anything to him because he told me that if I quit right before charter that he would blackball me so bad that I'd never get another job in this industry. And um, he roughed her up. And, and she, this was in, in Nassau, and she came to my boat and says, what do I do? And I was like, well, you've got a, a place here on my boat. I'm about to leave on charter, but you can go, I'll put you to work. So things like these happening in this industry, and if there's anything that I want you guys to leave here with today, if you're shoreside support, um, one is to know what really is happening 
on board the vessels and how you can help us and and educate us on our rights as, as to what we have. But if you're a crew member, if there's anything that I want you to leave here today with, it's the sense of feeling empowered to speak up and knowing that you have a moral obligation to yourself and to the rest of the crew members to say something. I know it's hard, but it's also hard for me to stand up here and talk about the sticky topics in this industry and wonder if I'm saying the right thing or the wrong thing or who's gonna come behind and say I shouldn't have said this or that. So if there's anything I want you to leave here with today, it's to speak up and have a sense of empowerment to do so. So what I want to dive into today is four sticky topics. I want to talk about drug and alcohol abuse. I had a, a day worker on the other day. I needed some help on the interior and she was telling me about a nighttime crossing which she got up to check on her captain to see if he needed a cup of coffee or something because it was late at night and she said she found him passed out at the helm with cocaine all over his face. So I want to talk about drug and alcohol abuse. I want to talk about bullying. I want to talk about sexual harassment. And I want to talk about gender and size discrimination. Because I did a reference check on another stew the other day was hiring recently. The stew position has been open on board and I did a reference check and the captain said she was amazing, she was great, she was a hard worker, she's this and that. And I said, okay, great, that, she sounds like she's gonna be a perfect fit. And we go to get off the phone and he says, but there's one thing you should know. And I said, well, what's that? And he says, she's big. <laughs> she's big? What do you mean? Well, like, <coughs> extra large skirt. And I was like, well, I don't wear an ex I don't wear a skirt. <laughs> But my shorts are extra large, so are you telling me that I'm too big for this industry? So these are the kinds of things that I want to address today. So, and how it affects our mental health. Because 50% of crew have said that they have considered leaving this industry because of the effect that stories like this have had on their mental health. 50%, that's half of us that are talking about leaving. And 53% have said that they've seen a decline in their mental health since they've joined the industry. So I've got Emma here with Seize the Mind to help me with some of the more technical stuff. So tell us, Emma, what, what is mental health and what leads to a deterioration and how these four hot topics that we want to cover today, how they come into play with our mental health? Hi everyone, nice to meet you. Um, well, mental health is just one facet of our health. Mental health, I think, for a long time has had a lot of stigma around it, a lot of shame. We haven't been talking about it because it's scary. I hear all the time, well, you know, we don't really know about mental health because we can't see it. But let's be honest, we can't see a lot of health conditions. Yes, we can see broken limbs and extend empathy, sympathy. We can't see cancer. We can see the behaviors and the signs and symptoms that come with that. And it's the same with mental health. So if we're more understanding, more astute, paying more attention to the signs and uh, symptoms that a person is displaying, their behaviors, then we can stop a problem in its tracks. Then we can kind of stop people getting hurt, accidents, all of the kind of things that we're gonna talk about today. So I want everyone to kind of have this understanding that we have multiple facets of health. Yes, we have physical health. We have a good relationship with that. We know what poor uh, physical health looks like, a rolled ankle, three days, maybe doing some computer stuff, but you're not sending me off the, the ship as a chef, you're just giving me some extra support in that time. Versus illness. And I think a lot of us jump to illness when we hear mental health because it's scary. But actually, health is robust. It's something that we are accountable for. It's something that we can do strategically to look after. So if we understand that there's health, there's also mental health, social health, financial health, and a lot of psychologists are now doing studies into digital health. So mental health is just one facet, one facet of our overall health. And again, something that we need to kind of get stronger, maintain, and be uh, kind of build our resilience. It's also, if you look at the WHO definition of mental health, it's how we think, feel, and how we behave. It's also uh, whether we're able to make a contribution to our society, professional and personal relationships. So it's something that we all have. It's, it's a basic human right. It is, exactly. It's a basic human right to, be, to have a sound, uh, a sound mental health, mental wellness, if you will. It's, it's a human base, a basic human right to be able to go to our place of work 
and to feel comfortable at our place of work and to feel safe and to feel secure and to be able to go to our captain and, and talk about an issue that has gone on on board and feeling safe to do so. Absolutely. And psychological safety is a key part. Like you said, it's a human right. And all the studies show, you know, we're kind of so proud about what our industry, and we should be. We've got incredible people, absolutely amazing people, crew members that are there wanting to do the best, wanting to give their all, enjoying this kind of lifestyle. Oh, I love this industry. Yeah, it's amazing. Same. I mean, it's there's literally not a day that I haven't jumped out of bed happy and excited to go to work, loving my job. Yes, some days the jump is not as high out of bed. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, I, I love my job and and the fact that and it's probably the relationships that I build with the people yeah it's not the places that we see it's not the boats that we get to run but it's the people it's it's the fact that that I could go and you any of us could go anywhere in this world and if we needed someone to help us out with something they would be there and so this industry is amazing but it's got some uh, it's got some uh, <laughs> archaic ways. Uh, sometimes I feel like we're still left in the caveman days with the way that we, we handle some of these things. So, and, and I think it's, like Emma says, it's, it's bringing awareness to it. You know, we have a basic human right to be able to fix a broken arm. We should have a basic human right to fix a broken mind. But not even fix it. Preventative medicine, exactly. health. You know, we, we, we exercise to keep our body healthy. You know, we don't, we don't wait till it's unhealthy. And that's another thing, too, that I've learned on my own mental health journey that, and, and I went through, I, I, there was a night at 2 o'clock in the morning that I, I was done. I went through a very long period of depression and um, woke up in the middle of the night and said, I'm going to do it. And I put my pants on and I was going to Walmart to buy some bullets. I was done. And, and thank goodness that and I attribute it to to my master's degree in chemistry because something happened snapped at two o'clock in the morning and I said wait your chemistry's off something's not right something's unbalanced wait till eight o'clock in the morning when you can go to the doctor you can talk to a, a therapist you can talk to a psychiatrist and you can get going doing what you need to do so what I'm saying about physical health and and preventative is I've learned that that it's continual, yeah. that it's it's not, oh, I'm bummed out, or I'm depressed now, or worse yet, I'm suicidal now. It's time for me to do something about it. No, it's just like exercising to to make sure that we maintain a physical health. Absolutely, consistency and being strategic about it. You know, if you get consistency with physical exercise, we know it makes us fitter, stronger, builds our endurance, and it's the same with mental health. Mm -hmm. There are things that you can be doing for yourself. There's accountability that you can have for yourself, for your own mental health. And by doing those things, you feel more robust. You stay in that kind of top half. You have maximum mental well-being and fitness. Does things change? Of course, we have risk factors. We have the issues that we talk about. We have accidents and traumas on board. So potentially that puts you down into the bottom half of the... Uh, yeah, so what are the, some of the things, Emma, that decline to, or lead to a decline in our mental health? Um, well, they're kind of known as risk factors, and that's going to be different person to person. It can be an accident. It can be bereavements. It can be uh, genetic, what we inherit from our parents. So there's lots of risk factors that go into our daily lives. But there are also protective factors, things that give us coping skills, conflict resolution, good communication. So it's about finding that balance, understanding that there are risk factors in our lives, identifying them, hopefully getting away from them, dialing down the risk factors in our life if we can, which often we can't on boats, but then turning up those, those protective factors, the things that build our resilience, build our strength, connect us to other human beings. Those are the things. So what do we do with things, on. you know, on board, there's burnout, no doubt. I mean, we're dealing with burnout, we're dealing with loneliness, you know, we're all away from home, we're, we're missing births, we're missing um, <clears throat> birthdays, we're missing weddings, we're missing holidays. So uh, in, in loneliness, isolation, burnout, sexual harassment, drug and alcohol abuse, and, and, and we turn to some of these negative behaviors and I don't think that there's, <clears throat> there's any doubt in our industry. We live together, work together, play together. Uh, at the end of the day, we're supposed to go share some little small box called a bedroom together. You know, there's a good chance that whoever we're sharing that room with 
might have been bullying us during the day too. So you've got all of these factors that I think really um, amplify, if you will, a lot of this in the industry and, and, and lead to s some people. I, when, when I can feel myself sliding into a funk, I work harder, I, which has its adverse effects as well. Um, because then at some point I'm going to crash and burn if I'm, if, if I'm avoiding what's going on in here. Some people turn to, to um, drug and alcohol abuse and there's a lot of that in this industry. Something that I, that I wish we could um, work a little harder at, you know, and, and finding out if a crew member is um, abusing drugs and alcohol, why? So a lot of these issues that we have in the industry, if you guys can remember to lead or approach them with compassion, for one, is definitely going to help. Um, check in with your crew members, even if it's your captain. Ask them, how are they? You know, I remember a day that my first officer didn't show up to work, which is not like him. I've worked with him for three years, and if you know him, he is, he is like top of the line, best you're going to get first officer. And I had a lot going on on the boat that day, and, and I, so I was huffing and puffing to my engineer, and I was like, where the hell is he? Why isn't he here? And he said, stop, wait. If he's not here, something's going on. So if you're dealing with a bully or uh, a captain that's passed out at the helm with cocaine all over his face, or someone that you feel that is sexually harassing you and you are so afraid that you have to go to a hotel room at night. First, protect yourself, but find out what's going on. Um, how, can we, how can we approach that person, first of all, to ask them if they are abusing, let's just, take, let's just dive into the topic of drug and alcohol yeah. abuse, <clears throat> Emma. So, so how can we, how do we handle that? When, when we've, we've got a captain, that, and we hear about it all too often, captains that are at the helm, operating drunk as can be. I went for a handover on my, on my, on my last boat and uh, showed up uh, for three consecutive days for what I thought was gonna be a proper handover and every morning at 9 a.m. when I showed up, he, he was drunk as a skunk. So uh, it, how do we, how do we, what do we do? Well, yeah, you're why, Well, maybe the first question is why? Why are we seeing, why are we seeing so much drug and alcohol abuse in the industry? Um, there's probably a lot of different factors, but I'm going to steal a line from an amazing um, psychologist called Dr. Gabor Mate, and he does a lot of research, research with addiction. And addiction can take many forms. It can be gaming, sex, drugs, alcohol. Um, he always says, don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain. So if someone is misusing or abusing drugs in any way or has any addiction, they have created a connection with that substance, with that drug that supersedes their connection with other people and themselves. So there's a lot of emotional underlying distress that needs to be dealt with. Now I know we work on yachts, potentially that's not an easy conversation, but what we say in mental health is to to ask what's going on, why the, why the pain. Don't concentrate on the addiction, just concentrate on the behaviors. You've changed, you, you're using a lot more, you're always drinking, and get that person to have a conversation around that. What do you do when you're a new crew member to that vessel or you're fresh out starting in the industry and you notice that a crew member is abusing drugs and alcohol? What, what do you do? Let's, let's say you're a junior stew and, and you see it. Do you take it? Do you take it to the first officer? Do you take it to the captain? Do you take it to your department head? What do you do when you see that a crew member is... is this is tricky, and I mean, we don't have any precedents. Yes, we have DPAs. Yes, we have uh, services like Seize the Mind or the Crew Coach. But when you're a green crew member, I think your lim uh, options are really limited. It's only, you're very dispowered as a crew member. Potentially it's your first job. Potentially you're worried about your reputation. So it is going to be hard. But you don't have to be. <laughs> but yeah. you don't have to be. And but you, we mm. still kind of have to be conscious of it because we're still operating in that archaic thing. Yes, we want to shine a light on it. But we still have to understand where people are empowered and where people are disempowered. We want to empower them. But that is a process. That's... That requires time, energy, education, 
conversations like this, publicity around this kind of uh, thing. So it's going to be it's going to be a while until a green stew feels comfortable saying anything, especially. And there's power dynamics. There's power dynamics throughout all of life. This is not a, a thing unique to our industry. You know, we have a chain of command. I respect that. We know why there's a chain of command. It's, it comes from safety, and I respect that. It's when we have power dynamics. If people are abusing their power, that's when it becomes problematic. But I think you have a moral obligation to yourself, regardless of your rank. I don't care if, 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 if you're the one doing the laundry on the boat, you're the second, you're the third, you're the fourth stew, or, or you know, you're down the ranks as the deckhand. You have a moral obligation to yourself and the rest of your crew members to speak up. So let's just, I'm, I'm gonna pick on captains for a minute. Um, Please do. I, I, th <laughs> I, uh, I think I can, I am one. Um, so what, what happens when you have the captain that's drunk all the damn time? Okay, so, so say something. Say something, you guys have to say something. The reason that, one of the reasons that we're in the situation that we are in this industry right now is because, and I've, asked so many crew members, why don't you say something? And they say, well, I'm afraid of losing my job. No, we don't have support. There's too much empowerment uh, out there. And I'm no offense, but I'm hearing, oh my God, he has gold on his face. It's like you guys heard it for the first time. I was 12 years old. There's no support for crew. I don't care what anyone says. There's n regardless if I'm 15 years in this industry or I'm a green crew, there's captains out there with reputation that is not great. So chiefs, crews, chefs, first of all, continuously getting jobs through the agencies that know that they are a problem and no one is doing anything about it. So yes, probably, I have now a lot of students coming to me on deck and complaining, but I can't do much for them. I'm a freelance chef now. But I hear the stories. They are getting worse and worse and worse. And it's like, you're sitting there thinking, when is it going to shift towards the more positive way? You know, Because hospitality on land is changing forward. Your thing, since I joined the industry in 2010, is going backwards. <laughs> I don't I'm sorry. No, it's not no, How many captains are here today, or officers? How Actually, many captains? Let's put a hand up if you're crew. Just a any crew agents. here, hands up, please. But let's just get so that's awesome. That half. Take care of the crew. Uh, how many captains are here? Many. There's two of us. So, so, you so you say we have no support, and I and I appreciate that because here's what I'm finding: is I'm I'm finding that when I ask crew, why don't you say something, and they say, well, I'm afraid of getting fired, mm. but when I talk to management and I ask management, why don't you guys say something? It's the same thing. They're afraid of getting fired. Or losing a client. That's, what, losing I, that's what I mean, that's what I mean by I getting fired. They're afraid, of losing, the they're afraid of losing the client. Please, I yeah. see you wanting to yeah. say something. And yes, I am focusing on all the shore side that's sitting in this corner. And, and, and I can see Chloe wiggling in her seat. So <laughs> she's, she, she's like, and, I, and I, hear, I feel that I'm hitting a nerve. So, so I see it, Chloe. I see you wiggling. So please tell yeah. us. Um, I'm a crew coordinator at Fraser, and uh, I'm dealing with a big, big of one client, so it's very particular, almo almost um, company management, basically. And from our side, I see we have a lot of claims of sexual harassment, abuse of alcohol, drugs, etc., depression, and stuff like that. So our jobs are uh, completely changed since it was before. It's not only drop the contract or dismiss or whatever, but now I feel like I'm not trained enough because I'm doing this mental support yeah. for depressed crew, mm -hmm. suiciding crew who calling you asking, oh, you know, I think I need to tell you bye. Mm -hmm. What am I doing? You yeah. know, it's very difficult. So you're but saying... No, but I'm saying in general, from our, our company, we'll have, we have ISM, mean ISM, and we have a safety provided to the, our fleet. So, um, and we always, we have the pre-boarding familiarization, and the crew, they know there is a paper in the crew mess and there is DPA number, so they know if there is a problem, and they can also, the captain, chief of department, chief officer, they can call this number, send an email, send an email to safety, and it goes to us and we do investigation. We, de we never leave any potential uh, difficulties on board. We have to resolve them. 
And um, from my side, we have to arbitrate also what is wrong. You know, we cannot just take one side or another side. Uh -huh. We yeah. have to look at this. Yeah, and sometimes we fair. begin with the uh, med day, the medication was taken, ING doctors, wherever it is, it's like a big thing. Uh, and um, let's say we're not afraid to take the position of the group because if we know that there is something goes wrong, we need to take it seriously because now all the sexual harassment goes to the court, etc., etc. So we really uh, follow the procedure of, of um, investigation and we do the escalation high and higher when it's necessary. It's from the, like what we do, and we see it like more and more often. Mm. So do you think there could be a space, or do you have anything that's if you've got someone that you've had complaints about? Like I, I wondered if a, a traffic light system may work because I know it's worked in other industry. You know captain crew everything's absolutely fine that person is a green light something comes up against them a couple of uh, conversations it's amber someone to be a kind of aware of and then red light is absolutely not we're not going to tolerate that behavior anymore is there anything like that in our industry well, levels uh, levels of the, the conflict let's say if we can deal with, by myself let's say okay i can deal with speak with captain we'll speak to the crew we can resolve it understand where it comes from it's one thing but when we see there is maybe something behind it we have safety involved and DPA, and we do the investigation already. In, it can be independent from the vessel, so we have the different point of view and we see what's going on, and then we escalate it further. Yeah, we speak with the employer, we speak with the contract, uh, uh, the contractual terms, what breach of contract, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we put the things together and we look at the situation. But this goes to Kelly's point: you have to hear that there's a problem yeah. for this ha and to the, happen, this and is this is like the vacuum that we have. Yeah. We're not empowered enough. We need to kind of start speaking out, and it is yeah. changing. Sorry, mm -hmm. just to give a little bit of optimism. Yes, I thought exactly the same as you. I was that girl with the the cocaine captain, the different story, and doing an elected crossing. So I know those stories have been around for years. I am not surprised by those stories. Yeah. And I looked around because I had my back up against door, literally. I cannot mm -hmm. tell you how many times I've had my back up against a door with someone on the other side of it, banging, trying to get to a girl or trying to kind of attack. So when I looked around, there was absolutely nothing or nothing that I could find. I created something. There's now Ice One. There's also MHSS. There's the crew coach. I have a huge Rolodex of uh, resources that are building, that we're growing, but it takes all of us, it, you know. It takes now, time. What we're looking for is a cultural shift. Yes. And, it's, and it, we're looking for a cultural shift in the industry and it's not going to happen overnight. And, and it's, it's going to take a, things like this. It's going to take businesses like you. It's going to take the crew coach. It's going to take iSwan. Um, it it two, takes everybody. Well, my boyfriend is a, uh, is a geologist and the two things he always talks about in geology is time and pressure. We need to, yes, it's going to take time, but we also need to apply pressure. That's how you get seismic change. That's and that's what I'm saying. Time. Pressure needs to you come from the top, not from the green crew. It needs and everyone. that's my point. We need, yes, we need to shine because a spotlight. Because I've made those phone calls many times to the agents when there was issues on board, and the answer was like, mm, you know, but I mean, you know, the owners need to be careful. Training, awareness, mm -hmm. strategic kind of uh, I completely uh, agree with that. You know, yeah. I was a manager in a hotel. I'm not talking here out of just being a chef, no, but what I'm saying is I don't see it from the top. I see it from, we talk about it. You know, I love crew coach as well. I've been on Zoom calls with her a few times, but it's a lot of talking, but it's a lot needs to be coming through everyone from the management, from the crew agent, from the captain, from the officer, from the chief steward, not from the green crew that comes through because they are too scared they're too stressed, they don't understand their rights, like you said. So I mean, then maybe it needs to be mandated. If we have mandated change, that's when you start to see real change as well. We can talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so having mental health be part I want to get to Chloe, because Chloe's still looking at me, and she's still squirming <laughs> in her seat. Yes. So, so. I've also seen one hand up, two hands up, so we'll come to you as you well. You look like you have something you want to say to me. Like I, like no, I, I'm very interested to, to listen to the conversation, and uh, we often hear that, oh, the crew agents who don't do anything, but we are very, very often the first point of call for support, mm -hmm. whether we've placed the crew member on board or not. Mm -hmm. We are very often to call you know, to find out mm -hmm. what, what can I do? This is my situation. Well, what something that, 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 that you just... Because you have no training in this. Yeah. Well, that's what you just brought yeah. forward, is you, you, you oh, and, and, and maybe you can feel the same sentiment, Claudia. You, you don't have, solution. yeah, you don't feel that you've had the proper training to deal with these things. So that brings to light something else. I mean, you, you guys are not mental health trained to be to be able to handle situations like this these are deep things so 
So while you're feeling you're not getting this support from management and higher levels. It's not for me personally. Obviously, I, I have a bit of a rowdy character, as you can imagine. <laughs> and I just say what I think. So I'm more like you. I, I do, too. <laughs> I don't know how much trouble it's going to get I've me in after this. I've been too, too much. <laughs> the thing is, I have a lot of friends that work in as a career agent, and I respect. I'm not saying you're not doing anything. I'm just saying that I've made those phone calls myself, too. And there's a lot of people that have made those phone calls. And there's a lot of times, thank God, she, what she told me now, this is the first time I've heard that the, uh, the actual career agent is doing So maybe it goes back to I communication, right? Mm -hmm. Communication in relationships, <laughs> communication in work. Yeah, so I'm maybe. Turning around saying that we are doing things. I'm not saying you're not doing anything. I'm just saying that, and I understand people need to earn money to look after their families. I'm just saying in this particular industry, a lot of times it's the owner's well-being over the crew. Well but if we, we lose the if we start setting a standard as as captains in management yeah. companies that we're not going to put up with it, yeah, those yeah, owners yeah. are going to have to do. They're not going to have any choice other than to behave a little bit better. Mm. So, but it's going to take a while. Yeah. So, 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 but what I find interesting as to what you said is you don't feel that you're properly trained to take on those issues. Another thing that I saw is, well, when you're saying no, we are the first stop for these crew members, and we do do something, then. Maybe there needs to be a, a call back to the crew member saying, okay, I did call so-and-so, and here's where we are in the investigation, here's where we are in the process. Because if nonetheless, that gives the crew member a peace of mind to know that what they called and reported didn't fall on deaf ears. But from the management perspective as well, I mean, we've all heard it, disgruntled crew members that are mad at their captain or they're mad at their department head and and because they were reprimanded and so now all of a sudden that department head or that captain is the bad guy and they want to throw them under the bus and uh, uh, you know just because you got you know reprimanded for something that you should have been doing so you do have to find the balances and to hear both sides of the story like you were saying so you wanted to say something Sunday. Um, one was a horrible story and the other one was just a very weird story. I've got a friend, I can reach out to you here and say, look, you know, where, what do I do? So I think maybe even something in the crew that I've been, like I, I swan or whatever, I swan, yeah. even information the crew houses maybe for these junior guys so they can note it We're down so if something happens. I mean, seriously, you're just like, oh my God, okay. You know, I don't I'm, think they know what they're supposed no. to do. I mean, Pete, I Pete, Pete we got flag state in the house, and he told me not to ask any questions, but I'm going to ask him. So, <laughs> <laughs> Pete, what, what can, what are some of the basic crew rights that they have for something like this? Who do they go to? What do they report? What sort of um, record keeping, gatekeeping system do we have for something like this? You wanted to say something? Yes, I have one question to the flag. Um, I have cases that the crew, they board, and they fill out a pre-boarding questionnaire, and they declare being on the antidepressants. How can I find if this is authorized and documentation to be taken on board? Because sometimes, like, they don't provide, they just say refer to the something else, and basically, I don't know what to do. I don't know if the person declared between his doctor or not. 
if they can be you know fit to work really or not. I have cases when we had to cancel the AG1 because the medical patient wasn't declared to the doctor. So well, let me tell you why we don't difficult. declare when we're on medication. Because then we have to get a medical waiver, and that medical waiver is probably not going to go through. Which So now we've lied on our medical that we're not on anything because we know we won't get either the medical or we won't get the license. So now we're on board, and we're gone into some other country for three, four, five, six months, and now... Um, we're coming off of uh, a, a cold stop off of our antidepressant because we couldn't tell the medical to tell the doctor then to tell the pharmacy before we left our country that we need a 90-day supply. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now what I'm taking to, to keep my chemistry balanced, whew, then you come off of that hard. You thought you had issues before you were on it. <laughs> so, There's so many people at the top of the industry who will say people with mental health issues just shouldn't be at sea. Mm -hmm. Like they've stood up and said that. I've seen it said recently in, in, in conferences. I'm diagnosed with general anxiety disorder and chronic depression. I think I'm a pretty, I think I'm a pretty good captain. I mean, my crew have been with me. Some of them, my engineer, two years. My first officer, three years. I mean, so it, it um, and y'all are willing to sit here and listen to me babble on. So I must be doing something right. But do you want to tell me just because you know depression runs in my family, or I have anxiety, which I, I've learned to control and manifest in positive ways by? studying my charts over and over and over and making sure that I'm prepared over and over and over. I've figured out how to channel it. You want to tell me that makes me a bad captain? We need to stand up and, and counter. We, I, one of us should have stood up at that conference and said... And that's what I'm trying to say. If that's important, you are, you are wrong. Yeah, exactly. Safety, we're all aware that safety is important, but if you, can't, you can't cut everyone with mental health issues out of seafaring. Yeah, but that's what we need. I mean, people get upset when I say something, but you need to stand up. Yeah. Yes. Like you say something. It's not about, I'm not slandering here everyone that works in this industry. I'm just saying, I don't see any changes. There's a lot of talking, there's a lot of new tools. I agree with that. I'm not saying that. But it's all online, Zoom, uh, chats, have a chat about your mental health. Let's have a chat about this and chat about that. There's no physical, particular thing that crew can actually. Do you want to call your DPA? Have you ever tried to call in your DPA? You know, I know what this one is? I know a guy that had a client who's a DPA who says, what do your crew need your crew help for? They, they get paid well. Thank you. <laughs> and this is the, these are the oh, attitudes we're up against. It's Go okay. Ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. It's important to have the conversations, it's important to have the groups, and I, and I said, the first thing that I said when I started off is if there's one thing that you get from here today, it's leaving here with a sense of empowerment and understanding that you have an obligation to yourself to speak up. Because if we don't ask, the answer is always going to be no. 
And if you do speak up as a young crew member about something, whether it's a whether it's a, a, an abusive engineer, or it's a crazy captain, or it's a chef chasing you around the galley with a knife, which I didn't know that was a real thing, but apparently it is. Um, Not you, me, obviously. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So if you don't say something, because at the end of the day, there's management that we're saying is supposed to support us. We're saying that, that Flag State is supposed to support us. But at the end of the day, there's only one person that's going to look out for you, and that's you. So if you don't say something, how can you expect for change to happen? Because they're afraid. They're afraid of getting blackballed. They're afraid of getting fired. You know what? Who cares if somebody cans you because you opened your mouth about something that is important to your mental health, your mental well-being, safety. your safety, say something. And if they fire you and you're a good crew member and you've made a name for yourself in the industry, before you get to the end of the dock, you're probably going to have another job. Okay? It is. I didn't even learn to speak up for myself until I was like in my 30s. Same. Like, and I think it comes with age too. Yeah. It yeah. Really it's hard. It's hard to say it. And you don't, you don't have the attitude if I get canned, it's fine. Because you've not built up that you know, yeah. personality within the industry. Not everybody knows you. It's one of the biggest problems is that connect to being able to speak out and knowing that you're going to be able to speak out with something that's going to but let me tell you a positive something that happened. I had a crew member reach out to me a month or so ago, and um, she too says, I'm going to a hotel. She called me late at night and says, I'm going to a hotel. I said, what's going on? And um, it was another creepy engineer. My, sorry, sorry, Alex, my engineer's in the back of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, so so I said, well, if you again, if you feel like you need to go to a hotel, go to a hotel. And I'm coaching her through it and everything. And 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 she's like, but I'm so afraid to talk to the captain. I'm so afraid to go to him. And I was like, well, do you have a, a, a good working relationship with your captain? And and she says, yeah. And she says, well, I kind of said something. And I said, kinda. I said, kind of. I said, we're juggling a lot of balls. We have a lot of things going on in our mind. I was like, you need to go back to him and you need to like say something. And she's like, okay, but I'm scared. And I'm like, but you can do it and you have to. I'm like, you're talking about your safety on board. So I'm like, is that really something you're willing to compromise? And she's like, okay, point taken, Kelly. I'm going. So she goes, she speaks to him. She calls me back and she said the captain had really no idea what was going on. And, and that is... And I see your eye roll, but, but give us a break because we are balancing a lot of things. We are juggling a lot of things. And sometimes, unless you come to us and say, hello, you know, like, listen to me. Here's what's going on. And so she did. And he had no idea what was going on. He rectified the situation. This is a very green, very young, very stew saying something. And this is the well, you should see my Instagram <laughs> messages. <laughs> but she comes back to me and says, she comes back to me and says, and she, she saw, you know, that I was coming over here and was super excited, and she sent me a message and says, I'm cheering you on. And she says to me, I should pull it up and read it word for word. She says, but because you encouraged me, I can encourage others now. So that's the domino effect that we will see, the cultural shift, the cultural change that I'm talking about. If I encourage her to speak up, brand new to the industry, she has a positive experience with her captain and her owner, and now look, everybody's happy. Uh, so it's clearly happening, because I think, as it, said, it seems to be the industry. I don't think it's getting 
I think, well, I think we're just reporting, reporting about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Now we need to go into that action phase, but it's like it's going to look really horrible for a little while until we figure out the action and that kind of feedback but it, loop and everything. It is going to be a process, though. We we accept that this is a dangerous injury, physically dangerous when we go to see when we're isolated. We do drills. We do our STCW because we know no firemen are coming rappelling down the side of our boat to save us. <laughs> it's true. So we have to be resilient. We have to acknowledge that we work in a dangerous industry physically and also mentally and one of the things that I have a problem and it's no uh, I'm not surprised that it's a lot of uh, females talking up a lot of females receiving calls we have this this lack of older females in our industry normally in a in a society you would have multi-generational tribes if you have someone who's new who's young who's green they are going to speak to someone older via Instagram, via Ice One, maybe a, a agent. But actually, the problem again with the industry is we don't have that multi generational in, uh, tri uh, female presence. Yeah, like we've got a one way door when we leave because we're pregnant. We've got a house that we want to refit. We are kind of leaving to go to the south of France. And actually, the problem <laughs> there is well, it's kind of what happens, yeah. right? Or like me, I've, I've said this I didn't want to be a 40 year old in a scort. I looked like I was playing netball every single day. <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem that we have. And when we have that disbalance that inequality when you have a lot of young people 20 to 35 year old females and 18 to 60 68 70 year old captains that is that's oh, another God, thing i don't want to see myself so I'm we are 80. kind of working on it and having those <laughs> please somebody tell me to go it's no it's not a fair well it's also you know having female deckhands having female engineers having it's having an age. And we're getting there. We're getting there. She's, she's, let me, let me get to her. She's dying. Her arm's about to fall yeah. off. She's like, I can't exactly. hold it up anymore. Exactly, exactly. Boundaries. But we're progressing. We are. I don't I don't think we're going back. I mean having things like this and and, and and speaking to management and having management in the house and you guys raising some issues, that's the point of putting us all together and having these talks is is because I feel I feel that captains and management have a really big impact on making the change in this industry. But you're telling me, well I don't feel I don't feel trained enough, I trained enough. And, I'm, and that never occurred to me that you're thinking you don't feel trained enough and you're telling me, well, well we do report, well, tell us, check in with us, give us a phone call and say, hey, I did make the phone call or hey, I did get an email back from so and so. And just, just that alone, knowing yeah. that we had that on the, on, the, on the other end. And so my point of this is to bring us all together to kind of hash this out, to, to figure out what we can do better and, and to empower everybody to speak up. I, you had something. Um, I do apologize for my voice, um, <laughs> but um, I work with Dom on the uh, World Day group for the PYA as well. Um, I have uh, uh, provided webinars as well, like the Black Study for Victory, um, that was James Hatcher, and I added Captain Lucy and Kelly at Marshall Island yesterday. Um, I want to pick up what this young lady has said about reporting. Uh, it's really important to document. You can't just go to management companies like Black Say and say, this person's harassing me. Mm -hmm. I've had mm -hmm. uh, constant abuse by this person yeah. X, Y, and Z. You need documented evidence of it, otherwise nobody can help you. Yeah. So it's so important to document what's happening. If you can get people into statements, get them into statements, mm -hmm. recording them where company is recording them. But, uh, you know, there are areas that you need to document it, you need photographic evidence. If you have been raped, you must go to the hospital, you must get a rape policy. All of these will help with your case because if you don't, it's a he said, she said That's, situation. You're really right, and let's go into this because it's, um, it's, it's 11.05 now, and we've only covered one of my four subjects. <laughs> i, I got to start talking really, really fast. Emma, speed it up. <laughs> um, so let's, let's go to sexual harassment. Um, it, what happens, I, I had a phone call after I gave my seminar in Palm Beach. 
um, the phone was ringing off of the hook, and, and, I'm, and I'm so grateful. But it, it was also very saddening. Um, a former uh, freelance student of mine called up about a, a friend of hers that um, that night after my seminar, her and some other crew members had gone out and uh, gotten a little too tipsy, and her girlfriend had gotten a little too tipsy, and got raped. And the situation was that she was in the States on a B1, B2, and had no contract. So now you have this crew member who doesn't want to report the offense because they're afraid that when they report the offense, they're going to find out she's over here on a, a here and being in the States on a B1, B2 with no contract. Pete, how can they, because I know you had a similar situation that we had talked about before, or anybody, what, what can you do in a situation like that? That's a whole other can of worms that I want to say how important contracts are to have. Yeah. But and reading them. Reading not just them. Reading them, them don't just sign them, but what... Uh, can flag state help? Can how do you then? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a police matter. I mean, if it happens in if it happens in jurisdiction, it's a police matter. So then, if you go to the police, and you're a foreigner, and they ask where your B one B two is, how can you? It's, I mean, the absence of I mean, okay, the, the contract issue. I mean, there are certain flag state or certain regulation regulation requirements that would be inferred even if you don't have a contract. So you know, if there is. The absence of a contract doesn't mean that you're not protected. Yeah. Um, so you know, repatriation, medical care, wages—they're all they're, there's there's a statutory obligation, regardless of whether there's a contract or not. So the the fact that they haven't got a written contract doesn't mean that they don't have, they, they don't have a contract. But if it's if it happens in in the jurisdiction, then it's a police matter, and we can't we can't intervene. Where it gets sticky is when it happens in international waters. Yeah, mm -hmm. on board. Because there is no Unfortunately, and the, and, uh, the case I mentioned with the case you're talking about, that was a rape in international waters. And yeah, unfortunately, uh, the, we call it a lacuna, there's a gap in the law. And the flag state weren't able to prosecute the jurisdiction in which, where the individual lived, couldn't prosecute. So effectively, the, the, um, the perpetrator evaded, you know, avoided um, liability because there was a gap in the law. But if, if it happens in, in the US or it happens in France or it happens anywhere, then it's a local police matter. And our, our advice always in that, that circumstance is report it to the police. They, they, you know, we, we had one case in Florida where they actually reported it to the Broward Police Department. They investigated, but in the end, they, you know, it fizzled out, but it was investigated. And country to country, obviously, it's going to be different. But to your point, going to a uh, get a rape test done post the assault, they are not asking you for your B1, B2. No, they're, they're not, not asking for anything. So asking. still get that evidence. You get to decide. You have agency whether you want to escalate it and be it becomes a police matter. But, still but that's why I want to bring this up is, is, is some people, that, well, this young lady in particular was fearful. She didn't want to say anything. We finally encouraged her and talked ourselves blue in the face to go ahead and go and get, you know, get the proper examination and to go ahead and register the complaint, the, the, the event with the local police department, and they did. And um, I was there in South Florida and, and actually kind of followed up on it, and they, they, they prosecuted the fella. Um, and she never once did they ask for her B1, B2, but that's not saying don't still get your contract because it makes it a lot easier when you're, you know, somewhere making sure that you have a proper contract to just more support knowing, reading, understanding your rights. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to say a little bit on the sexual assault thing. I mean, I won't go into the whole getting raped example, but that's actually kind of harrowing for a lot of mm -hmm. people. That's why they don't go do it. But we do see as management companies, I'm sure you have as well, a lot more kind of sexual harassment, sexual assault. We've seen a lot more around consent yeah. now as well. And it's like people expect as a management company that we're going to turn around and go, okay, so get that person off the boat because this person has been raped. We are not there to legally say whether a rape has happened or not. What we can do is say whether they have broken their contract, whether a person is no longer safe, and then get them off the boat. But it becomes really, really complicated.
especially when it's a case of consent and yeah. he said, she said, or yeah. it's behind closed doors yeah. and there is... Or well, there's alcohol no involved. No a lot of alcohol, a lot of, I'm not really sure, involved. maybe it was. That's and problematic. Of the way that that kind of finishes is that both the parties involved leave the vessel because it's no yeah. longer, you know, it's not safe for either of them to be viable. on board. It's not viable. It's yeah. not going to work with either. And actually, and people think that's really harsh, but we're not there to say we think whether and this or not, and they both go. But I think what's really, really important is that whoever's making that decision, whoever's involved in that investigation, also knows and informs the crew member, here's the help that you yes. can get for both parties, because especially yes. when it comes to consent, you might have a female who's there who has you know, been raped, and we say abused, but been raped, she needs to support, but also the yes. male crew member is suddenly sat down thinking, am I a rapist? I thought this was yes. all okay. I don't, I don't know what's going on here. There's Something two sides to every story. Yeah. yeah. So make sure that it finishes with support for all the parties who are involved. I don't know if like this is when I was in college during 2017, I graduated the freshman year. They took me down for all the you know, orientation and everything. They, big, a huge thing. They talk about it like every year. They took you down. Like you can't consent if you're not sober. That was one thing. This, this is where like, this is exactly yeah. where so I want to go. Lots coming from American <laughs> universities because they also have problems with drinking. They also have problems. This with industry has a problem with drinking. Yeah. And you guys have to own it. You guys have to, at some point, take on a personal responsibility. If you're going to go out and you're going to get plastered, bad things might happen. And so, so, I, it, it's if the the whole drinking thing is 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 frustrating to me um, on a couple of different levels because, you know, I ran a really busy charter boat, and when we would drop charter. I could easily say as a captain, let's go over to Atlantis and blow our $4,000 tip. Or I could say, hey guys, let's go to dinner, have a couple drinks, come back to the boat, you know, watch a movie, chill, hang out. And there's, there's a couple of different ways I could go with this, but one is captains have such an influence on, on their crew members' behaviors because they're going to follow you. Do you agree? If you're going to go out and you're going to, if you're going to say, go, let's go to the Atlantis and blow our tip, they're going to go. My, my crew, we don't ever go to Atlantis to blow our tips, you know, <laughs> but, but it, or, or if they do go, I say, if they do want to go, I say, how much you taking with you? Well, some people may say, you know, your crew members money is none of your business. Well, you know what? They're my crew members. And I kind of wish when I was, when I was young, somebody was asking me, you know what I was doing and they're, they're actually thankful of it. So captains have a huge, huge, huge responsibility. And I kind of think it's time that they aren't, they start stepping up uh, uh, to the plate as to, to what their responsibility is. But going back to the drinking, if you're going to go out and you're going to get plastered, you have to understand and accept that something bad could potentially happen. It's, it's, it's very frustrating to me when, when someone says, you know, that, that I drank too much and X happened. That's terrible. There's, that never should be. But if the, if, if the other party is plastered too, so then everybody's um, wherewithal is compromised, you know? So like you were saying, well, he said, I, I, I thought it was consensual. You know, so so have in this have some personal responsibility. Like I said earlier, the only person, the only person that's going to advocate for you is you. And if you don't watch out for yourself and if you don't speak up, you can't. Yes, management has a huge responsibility. Yes, captains have a huge responsibility. And, and I work my tail off to watch out for my crew members. But at the end of the day, you've got to act like a grown adult and and think um go ahead she wants to say nice things about captains <laughs> no, actually my husband is a captain so actually when he has a problem with the, with the crew finally he he admitted he can ask me for help uh, so he always asks for advice which is nice uh, but it's because i was a manager in a hotel he hasn't done management training except for health which is not really a lot for him it's five days yeah. <laughs> it's five days. Yeah, but he feels like he doesn't, you know, he sometimes has problems, he wants to ask how to behave. Now, on my first ever boat, I had an amazing captain who actually made a rule, which might work for some, I don't know, that if crew members get really drunk, regardless if there's guests on board or no guests on board or whatever, he doesn't want them on the boat. 
he says if they are t to that limit when they cannot walk straight, he said you go into the hotel. I run a dry boat. Exactly. I run a dry boat. And nobody, nobody too. on on nobody on my crew yeah. drinks. So um, I think, like I said, the captains. In terms of when when we're yeah, yeah, and it's um, I every now and again, you know, um, my engineer had a glass of wine yesterday and I thought I was going to have to carry the big guy back to the boat. I mean, it was a half a glass and he's hee hee hee. <laughs> and I'm like, whew, I'm glad you don't drink and I can tell you don't. But, um, you know, I, I, I run a dry boat and, and I think that there could maybe stand to be a little bit more of that in this industry. Why don't, instead of us going out and, and going to a cocktail event or getting plastered, why, why aren't we having some sort of competitive health event or, um, you know, instead of captain's crew and cocktails, why can't it be um, ca captain's crew and kickball or something like that? Why can't we? But these things aren't going to happen until things like this, like you're saying, and thank you, until more groups like this start speaking up and there's more conversations like this because, uh, and I've just learned so much from, from, from this corner of management so far as, as to what you're saying and how you guys handle things and do things. Chloe, go ahead. Yes. So you we have to, to no, so you're again, right. Th there's an importance and about training as well. We know that there's certain things that are going to be very dangerous on a boat. Maybe we have to accept that that is going to be one of the dangers that we have to incur. We have helipads, we have uh, going to sea. If we do know that that is in the industry, and when you said that, lots of heads nodded, it's not a secret, we all know that, then we need to put training in place. Yes, that's brilliant if you're doing training before the cadets go, but we need that mandated training. It needs to be part of the STCW. Mm -hmm. It also yes. sets the tone at the beginning of a crew members um, at the beginning of their journey. I remember doing my STCW and it was incredibly empowering. I was like, wow, I can fight fires and all of that kind of stuff. But it also set into my mind, <laughs> literally. But it also set this kind of 22-year-old South African thinking that was desperate to get on boats, desperate to start earning money, desperate to do what her friends were doing. Like, wow. I thought this was all like, you know, cocktails and Colgate smiles and fabulous places there is a there is dangerous elements to our jobs and there's two things we as you know uh, kind of the industry owe to make it more and more safe every single year through policies through management through all of that but also the individual has to have some accountability and have yes. that have that strength do the training and keep doing it throughout so, so if, if you... things are happening you remember what resources are available? What can I do for myself? Where do I report it? It needs to become systematic. And as we see boats, bigger and bigger boats coming out, hopefully we are going towards that more professional uh, kind of bent. I mean, CEO, I mean, captains now, if you're a 100 meter captain, you're more like a CEO than a captain, yeah. right? You're running a desk. You've mm -hmm. got 60, maybe 90 people that you're in charge of that you have a duty of care for, and there's no HR, there's no reporting, there's no kind of systems really in place. I mean, the we joke all the time captains. about you want to call HR. Well, you got to call me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> on my right. boat. I am HR, you know. So but position, you're doing the best, and hopefully, you're like the best ones are rising, and they're the ones that people they want are. To work they for. are because I study all the time. I watch exactly. uh, you. I have favorite YouTube channels that I watch on leadership and sexual harassment, and and I am constantly thinking about things that I want to do because our, uh, you know, our program doesn't have. Um, you talk about. MLC compliant boats that have sexual harassment and bullying policies in place. I'm on a U.S. flagged private boat. <laughs> like we don't have, there's not a lot in place there. But that doesn't mean I can't. That doesn't mean that I can't find a source, um, a, an online training course or something that we all sit down in the salon and, and that we do on bullying and that we do on sexual harassment. Yes, I know it's probably only just a day long course or take Emma's mental health first aid course. I know it's only a day long, but it's something and it's a start. Two days. And it's, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> two days. Sorry, Emma. You know, so, but it, it, that, these are the things that, so take these things on yourself as well and do that ad, ad, ad advanced professional development and that professional growth and even personal too like you're saying we have to watch out for for our own well-being if i know that I, i'm in a in a tough situation that's going to trigger me or something like that then get myself out of that situation i want to go back to what you were saying chloe about about owners and guests that 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 are doing drugs um 
if you join a boat and the owners are doing drugs, you can leave the boat. Yeah. You do not have to stay. <laughs> so there, it goes back to there is some, some personal accountability and some personal responsibility. You don't have to stay there. And if you got the job through the management company, call Chloe up and say, Chloe, whew, they were, it was a little too wild on that boat for me. That doesn't fit. I've left. Can you help me find something else? And Chloe's going to say, absolutely. You know, she's going to help you find something that fits you. So then where I'm going is this forces, it's kind of a forced change. Because at some point, that owner is going to call Chloe up and go, Chloe, why don't I have any crew members? You know, and hopefully, ho but hopefully, and I know, I know it's a business that you're running, and I know that potentially that customer has been your customer for however many years, but if management then starts to stand up and say, well, if you'd stop snorting so much coke, maybe you'd have some crew on the boat. I mean, that's how I'd say it, not very diplomatic, but <laughs> Chloe, I hope you're better at it than me because I probably wouldn't be a very good management company if I said it like that. But, but so it starts to, I think we see, going back to that cultural shift like you and I were talking about, it starts to, as we start stepping up and we start standing our ground, whether rules and regulations and governing bodies come into place and, and, and start helping us, if we just stand our ground and we say something, then it forces the bad crew members, kind of snuffs them out. It takes the bad owners and it kind of snuffs them out. Now, this isn't something I'm saying is going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. We're talking about a cultural shift, and it's going to take a while. Um, there was... And I can. Yes, this is where the level needs to also, you know, not only at the agents, the agents and everyone doing a great job. You know what I want to? I want to commend. I um, I think probably if you're management in here or you're a charter manager, you guys probably know Daphne Duofe from Ocean Independence. And I ran one of the industry's busiest charter boats. We cranked out 20 week-long charters charters a year, and Daphne was awesome. I don't know how that woman balances the owner the boat manager and the captain and the charter but she does an amazing job and it was little things that she did for me she'd call me up and she'd go kelly i know you just ran four back-to-backs i've got another inquiry can you do it she's like say no if you can't and i'm like uh because she knows i would never want to say no and she would like i she's like i have to present it to you but i don't think she's like i <laughs> And she, she would even tell me, she's like, I haven't even called your management about it right now because I wanted to come to you to see how exhausted you were. And that meant so much to me that she called me. But I, even if she had called my manager first, I had a great, great, great manager on my last boat. Anything that I asked for, I got. And, and anything that I put my foot down on, he, he stood ground on. And I, could, and I could tell Daphne, no, Daphne, I'm, I'm exhausted. Or I had, I had somebody doing drugs first day on my charter, and I called my manager up, and I called Daphne up, and I said, um, I'm giving them one chance. They, they throw it overboard, or we're gone. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we're going back to the dock. They were so supportive. Both of them were like, absolutely. There is, you know, no. So, but we need more of that. Yeah. We, we need more of that. We need more of that support of, of putting aside that 20% commission that you're making on that charter and understanding that, that I'm cranking out 20 week-long charters a year. That's a lot, you know, because in between that time when I'm trying to turn the boat over or even just try to fix what we broke on charter, it's, it's so we need that support. So I've, I've got to say that 
th that my time with Ocean Independence and Daphne was just absolutely amazing. But we need we need more of that support. But then management needs the support to be able to support us. Yeah. Yeah. But I think having conversations like this, and so maybe you take back to your management and say, hey, you know what, I'm. Uh, yeah, but, but seriously, you take that back and you say, hey, I keep I getting phone calls about this. You know, I'm happy to help the crew, but I'm not properly trained. And you guys, that never dawned on me. I'm sitting here thinking, you know, and, and I had some conversations with some pretty heavy hitters in the industry about who had the greatest ability to make a change. And captains and management is where it comes down to. But we need the support. So when I'm sitting up here harping about all of this, and, and I'm saying that, that captains and management have the greatest ability to, to make this cultural shift and this change. Don't forget that we need the support too. So if I'm grouchy, don't just say, oh, God, Cap's, Cap's being a bitch today. Why don't you ask me why? Why don't you ask me, is there something I can do for you? Can I take something off your plate? And I have an amazing crew because when I am stomping through the boat grouchy about something, they ask me, you know, why? Why you got your crappy face on? Your crappy cappy face, <laughs> and, you know. And and they ask me, is there something we can take off of your plate? Is there something that we can do? I mean, my engineer is here with me, carrying around the camera. He's carrying around the purse. It looks really good on him. He's back there telling me, you know, he's giving me my times to let me know where I'm at. Um, but no, I. But again, to that point, that's because you're a good leader that has an open boat. They feel safe to ask you, Are you okay? What's going on? Why are you stomping around? And there's so many other people that just aren't like that. They lead by fear, and we know that hurt people hurt people. So that's so why I say if we, can, if we can come from a place of empathy, I think that's the main thing. So if you're, if you're the deckhand or if you're the first officer, if you can come from a place of empathy and say, what's wrong? What's wrong? Are you? I'm constantly checking in with my crew to ask them if they're okay. Um, and they do check in with me, but... but it's not just us taking care of you. Turn back around, or if your management, if your management's trying to cram a sixth back, back to back charter down your throat, ask them. Say, hey, are you getting some heat from the owner? You know, are you getting some heat from the owner? And they're probably going to say yes. He told me that I can't turn this charter down. Yada yada yada. And then you, that opens up that dialogue. That opens up that sense of of comfort and honesty and willingness to share. Yes, ma'am. And have I, all the answers. I struggle with that. There's a lot of I, I, yeah. as well, and there's certain, you know, masculinity things that come into that. As and well. generational things. And generational yeah. things. We have a male captain in the room. <laughs> so I I struggle because I'm like, I'm the captain, I'm supposed to have all the answers, and I'm supposed to be this big protector, and I'm supposed to have my shit together, know what I'm doing, and like I'm supposed to be smiling and happy and and, and all of that. But you know, I also on my on my mental health journey throughout my life have learned, no, you're not going to be smiling every day all day, and actually, exposing and being vulnerable and <laughs> posting this on the on the internet for the whole world to see, you know, takes guts. But the response that you get then when you open yourself up. So, coming at it from a even a male captain's perspective, unfortunately, still in this world in 2023, men still aren't uh, allowed to shed a tear or to be sad or to be grumpy. So how, her asking, how, how do you handle it? Do you open up to your crew? Do you feel like you can open to your crew? Do you think you should, if you're, if you're not, be, should we be able to be a little bit more human?
So yeah, it is, it is hard, but I think if we know, one of the things that I worry though is when I'm honest about maybe something that's going on in my life as to why I've been stomping around the boat like a grouch, you know, is exposing myself and being vulnerable like that, are my crew, are, are, are they going to use that against me later? Are they going to perceive me, you know, as weak? I, I had a I had a sexual assault issue um, happen against me, to me, about a year ago by one of my own crew members. I've never said anything until now, so, and Emma and I, Emma and I talked about it, was I, gonna, was I gonna say anything about it? That's embarrassing to stand here and say that it's happened to me as a captain. I'm supposed to be this big, strong pillar of strength and the crew member's gone now. But, I was I was very embarrassed when that happened and 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 even now what's going through my mind is now that I'm sharing this with with the room and I'm sharing this with uh, in a few days when it goes on social media to the whole world you know how are people going to perceive me but the rest of my crew were supportive uh, they were supportive you know and and encouraging that you know that it it wasn't me, you know, that it, that, that particular crew member that, that did what he did, um, it was on him. I, I think I had my engineer see it, he wanted, probably would have killed him, but, <laughs> you know, but that's the, that's the closeness that, that I have with my crew members. So to answer your question, it's hard, and I'm glad you brought that up, um, because it is, it is, it is tough as a captain as to, Part of the conversation, open, yeah. Being part of the conversation because you know it's coming back to management and captains. Well, we're here. <laughs> we're I'm screaming from the rooftops. Me and Emma are. We're <laughs> screaming from the rooftops, and we're like, "Come!" And this is a start. We have one captain in the room. It's a start. And when I, it's a start. And when I saw so much management come in, I was like. <laughs> oh my god. I was like this is the beginning of the Yachty Me Too. Yeah, yeah. yes. We have to talk about well, that's why I called it Yachty Minds Matter. <laughs> you know? Um yeah. Oh good, there's three of us in here. Sorry, I was late. Um don't you know we're very punctual. Like you're you're setting a bad example. <laughs>
that's going to be you know harder again. Up until mm-hmm. the new first dynamics. Day, I've, yeah. I've had yeah. Three years now from two folks, so you know if I have my personal conversations with him, and he knows when I've got the shit and something bad in my life is happening. But yeah, you know, bad stuff happens to everyone. But you got to keep that to yourself when you're on the job, and to keep everyone else focused on the job. Mm-hmm. Someone said that. <laughs> <laughs> and you just said bad stuff happens to everyone. Like everyone's going through something at some point. Like somebody could be on a boat and their brother dies or the dog dies. Like family dog dies. Anyway. Like, we're all they're going to be going through something. We're all fighting some sort of our own mental health issue. Every single one of us in this room is battling something in our mind. And and I think that if we can all just again lead with empathy, empathy and compassion, and yeah. compassion and, and kindness. Yeah. So how do we deal with some of these? What's the what are some of the key things that we can do to to get ourselves out of a sticky situation or or prevent ourselves from from getting mentally unwell? Um, what are the, some of the things that we can do, and some of the resources that we have? We yeah. have you. We have the crew coach. Um, I mean, there, there could be a we thousand have... answers to that. But I mean, like you said, taking accountability, realizing that it is health. It's one of those facets of health. Becoming strategic about your physical health, your social health, financial health, and also mental health. Taking accountability and owning it, letting other people know what you're doing. I know when I started, you know, to not drink meant that you were the worst word in yachting. To be called boring is like, ugh. <laughs> but actually, I like, because I didn't have the strength to say it when I was younger, I kind of, we had to figure out a way. So if I told people that I was training for something, I'm training for a marathon, I was allowed not to drink then because there was a focus. So kind of getting strategic about your, your care, being uh, open and communicating, having that empathy, having that open communication, which I know we only can do that when we have psychological safety, when we feel safe to have those conversations. Um, but I would say, yeah, I would say identify the resources that are out there, what they do, and so how they can help there's, you. There's you in your mental health first aid course. Yeah. There's Karen of the Crew Coach. There's iSwan. Yeah. Um, so there's Medair, there's MSOS, exactly. there's, and I know I'm missing some. MHSS there, yes, is really good there's, as well. Yes, and I posted a bunch of links on my website too. Um, I wanted to print it out with you, but I was flying all the way across from the pond, so I couldn't come with a suitcase full of printables. But um, it, go to, and she, I have her link too on my website as well, so if you want information about the resources that that are there that are available to you because if you're wondering who can I talk to who can I go to there there are people there but again to the point I can't remember who said it it's about taking that accountability you if you have MSOS or Medair you can call and get discovery calls how does this work what is going to be told so when I'm going into a conversation and they put up a barrier and say oh no I don't want to do that in case someone finds out you can confidently say I'm telling you right now that this will not be on your record with uh, Meta at Pearls of Wisdom they explained the kind of the process and actually if the the mental health uh, counseling service is available I know Corrine also sells blocks of um, counseling the captain the management they don't know they're just paying for an extra service it's an extra couple of hundred a year but that person has complete confidentiality. So when you're looking at your contracts, when you're reading, also book those discovery calls. Really important to do that for yourself and get that knowledge, get that confidence, but especially important if you become a head of department. As you become a head of department, you have a duty of care to look after people. And people are going to ask these questions and you are gonna get into these situations, unfortunately, because we cannot change the industry. We're trying, we're starting, this is our first steps and we're kind of looking to people to support us and also bring things to the table. And if you can't, and if you, and again, personal responsibility, or if the vessel, a lot of, and a lot of times I feel like the interior department gets left behind in terms of training. Guys, you can learn yeah. anything and on chefs. YouTube. Like, do you know how many YouTube channels that I watch on leadership, on sexual harassment, on bullying, on what to do, and just, and reading, I read tons of articles, I'll, I'll, when I was dealing with a sexual harassment case on my boat, uh, you know, I'm, I'm reading the company policy, and then I'm also reading a million other different, po- like, there's, you, you can research it yourself, you can, you can learn a lot about 
anything anymore. You know, I, I hate to stand up here and say, well, Google it. But even when I was teaching chemistry and I would get asked a question about something, I would say, well, let's, you know, let's see what they got to say at this and that resource. But so take that. Yes, I'll get, I'll get to you in just a second, Dan, but go ahead. It's starting to change now. It is. It is. Yeah. Yes. That and thank you. And it's going to be case by case. You know, we practice drills. We do all of the case studies when we're doing our training, and we know. It's never perfect when we're in the situation. There's never, you know, there's never a person telling us to keep doing the compressions. There's never any kind of blood or urine or piss or any of that, that kind of stuff. So we do the training and then we have to apply it to the situation, which is why we can't ever give you a hard and fast answer, especially when it comes to really complicated, very complex um, issues like this. And again, it might be about your relationship with alcohol. It also might be about your age as well. Potentially, you're a slightly older person that has that confidence to kind of stand up, but acknowledging that there's going to be younger people or not as confident people, like you said, the advice is always kind of go and get a rape test kit, do all of that kind of stuff. But we're forgetting all the gray areas, all the porous boundaries where that person's kind of creeping into our space. All that person doesn't want to do it because it is such a violation and they've already been violated. So we're giving advice, we're kind of setting the tone and everything, but know that you have to think about it and then apply it to the situation in front of you is important. Well, something that's a softer approach to that, and I've said it to a crew member who I ended up firing because it was out of, out of control, but um, was I did one year no beer, you know? I did that, I started 28 days, then 90 days, and yeah. just kept going and got fitter and stronger, and I approach it that way because I think there's still a negativity if you say, oh, I'll go to AA or whatever, which there shouldn't be. There shouldn't but that's be. the thing, isn't yeah. it? You know, people go, oh, you weren't that bad. I'm like, I'll start at sober <laughs> kudos to you for coming kudos to you for admitting it yeah. seriously seriously Dan you had something Dan and then Joanna Um, I mean, yeah, we've got welfare groups that are online that are doing amazing work. We have people that are starting businesses. We also have amazing people in, in insurance kind of uh, doing marketing. Is that one -to -one as well, um, it depends. It depends. It's about doing kind of some investigation, those discovery calls that I'm talking about. I think potentially why a lot of us have gone back into the industry and made our businesses around it is because, and this is me, I'm, I'm not projecting, but I left the industry and I knew what was going on. Now, I could have just walked out, closed the door, fuck them, I've had my bad experiences, but I chose to leave that kind of drawbridge open and I've actually ch chosen to, to make a business because I don't want any, any human to ever feel the fear that I felt, to have their back up against the door while someone's trying to break into it. And if I can keep the conversation going, if we can be provocateurs, start conversations, not always have the right answers, but invite people with the answers, I think <clears throat> She of the Sea, there's, there's lots of different programs that are springing up and it's not just female on female. I just happen to notice that there's a little bit of a, a disbalance there. And potentially that's where a lot of the problems come from is the disbalance. So trying to rectify that or trying to at least bring kind of more of a balance into the industry, whether that's through groups, mentorships, one-on-one, -on -one, mental health training, better insurance policies, PYA groups that talk about well-being. 
at least if you are engaging in things, if you are going through something, more and more resources are coming to the forefront. And if you don't know what's available, call me. I know what's available. Yeah. One call. Yep. And I know, you know, we talk about a lot of procedures and policies and all of this is really brilliant. But if a person has just gone through something and potentially they've already got low self-worth, low self-esteem, asking them to jump through hoops, asking them to fill in forms, asking them to do that, that's an immediate no. It sounds exhausting. And what a lot of people, what a lot of people that we find is they end up just retreating, they end up blaming themselves, they end up questioning themselves, and then they just remove themselves either from the boat or the industry. And it does not need to be like that anymore. We're trying to make a change. And we will. And Thank so you. and and so and then, really yeah. Joe. So, I just wanted to say quickly, you were talking about resources that people can use. You absolutely pro your your boat will probably have crew insurance. And there may well be cover there of, for you to have outpatient mental health treatment or, yeah. you know, if, if something terrible happens, you can have inpatient treatment. The other thing I wanted to point out about that is um, it's important for the crew members to have access to the crew insurance yeah. without having to go to their superiors mm -hmm. in yes. this particular field. So if you have an unnamed policy or you have a policy that requires um, validation of the crew member's employment, that's, that's not ideal. So if you want them to be able to access those, you should make sure you have that kind of policy. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. ask the questions. I just wanted to add that, you know, I think, it, you know, this is probably the second mental health seminar that I've been to, and I've been in this industry for a long time. So I think what we're seeing here is it, there has to be a willingness to talk about this. Yeah. And it's okay to talk about this. You know, like this gentleman here, who is happy to, to talk about his mm -hmm. you know, health problems with alcohol. So I think the more we do this, the more we really, you know, other crew members, I mean, when I, we first spoke and you, you shared your experiences with me and where you're where you're coming from and the messages you're sending and uh, us, us as a flag state you know we were prepared to get behind you or to respond to this event so you know because we we believe that, that i think we just got to get the message across that it's okay to talk about these issues nobody's going to look down on you and other people are suffering the same thing and they probably if they feel that they can talk about it um i think that's that's just got to keep Look at the room. Yeah, I know. Look, look at the room. I'm the just room like, and and I, and I, ha yeah, and I have to say, you know, and yes, so Pete is responsible for <laughs> for this for this driving force because when I when when I had this sexual assault happen to me and I had been hearing stories over the years, I finally said, all right, enough's enough. I've grown a voice in this industry, and this is something that I'm going to speak out about, and and I'm I'm going to run with this. And then I said, "Come on, you know, Emma, we're going." And um, but when I said to Pete that I'm going to do that, you know, he says, "Good. If you're going to do it, do it, do it well. Leave them with something to walk away with, but don't stop." Pete said to me, "Don't just do one and be done. Keep running with it." And I have to say, thank you to Pete and to Cayman Island Flag State for sponsoring this, for pushing me um, to continue to do it. Um, EYS, Engineered Yacht Solutions, from across the pond as well, they've been with me since the, the very beginning. They've sponsored me. They've helped me get here um, without these folks. And um, Ocean Independence, and, and I already spoke of Daphne and how supportive she's been. She's been amazing, but you know, Ocean helped me get here too. Um, Vilma and Josie back there from Casa de Campo, I mean A crew for providing the spot, Emma for when I called her up and said, hey, do you want to go to Monaco? <laughs> <laughs> That's yes, right? You know, you know um, Liquid Yachtwear for sponsoring this, but, but two, seeing my sponsors in the room, um, knowing that Tom and his wife, who I see frequently working in the boatyard on my projects and stuff like that, um, and I told him, you know, Yesterday, Tom said one of the nicest things that he could have um, on a podcast about me, and he, and he said she's going places, and we want to go with her. And I about cried when I said that. And with Pete, who who met with me at, at Starbucks a couple of weeks ago ahead of this event, and and he's coaching me through because he's done so many of these events. He's coaching me through. Okay, you might run into this, you might run into this, and but keep going and asking me about my deliverables and what you know, I'm going to leave the audience with at the end of the day. And I mean, it's just, um, 
you know, I, I can't say thank you enough to, to my sponsors. I really can't because there's absolutely no way that I could have flown over here and put this all together and done this without you guys. So thank you very, very much. And to um, all of you, um, there's, there's an amount of fear that comes with doing something like this. There's, um, one, will anybody show up? What if nobody shows up? Oh my God, what if nobody shows up? <laughs> you know, so there's that. There's standing up here and saying this, recording it, releasing it on all my social media channels for everybody to see and hear. Um, there's a level of, the, of um, vulnerability that it takes to do this. I try not to think about it because it might scare me too much. But you guys coming and being here, like it's, you guys are the driving force for me to be able to speak up and to talk about this. So I can't thank you guys enough for coming today and, and for management when I'm saying things that are triggering you and you're squirming in your seats about things and, and bringing things to light that I hadn't ever thought about before um, and, not, and, not, and not holding that against me and not being um, uh, judgy or mad or it, it, and understanding that I'm trying to bring us all together to figure out what is it that management needs, what is it that the captains and the crew need. And like I said, if there's one thing that I want you to leave here today with. It's a sense of being empowered, understanding your personal and moral responsibility to speak up because the answer will always be no if you don't ask. And I have two more people to thank. <laughs> My engineer, <laughs> the keeper of time, <laughs> the purse holder. Uh, my purse looks really good on him. Um, and, and the guy in the back of the room doing the videography. He's been with me since the beginning. So this all came about sitting on a garage floor in the back of a 72 princess in Chicago, Illinois. a good step in the right direction to what I think needs to be a cultural shift in this industry. Yes. I just want to mention something. It's actually a strength to speak about it and not to weep or like, yeah, yeah. just to weep that we're like afraid to speak about it. It's actually a strength to stand up for you and be aware of the problems or like around you. Or even if you yeah. know someone who doesn't really feel good and you feel okay, you still can speak, thank you a lot or something like that. Yes, thank no. you. Be kind. Yes. I really try not to be to a guy. Um, I just want to say regarding resources, you know, we've been at various talks together, all of us, and we've discussed a, a category we have on our platform, which is now mental health and well being under the medical section. And what we're trying to do is give an objective view of the courses that are recommended to us. You know, we're not making any money from it at all. It's literally just to put it out there to say these are the courses that are available for you, whether you are being or You're right. This is huge. This fellow coming and this and sharing his experience and you sharing your experience. That's a step in the right direction.
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Velma, you had a question. Thelma, <laughs> Thelma, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> Thank you. And when do I get my dress? Velma just went to Paris Fashion Week. She, um, so Velma, pretty much her and Josie run Casa de Campo. Like they are Casa de Campo down in the Dominican Republic, and. Um, she's she's an amazing woman she just came from Paris Fashion Week and she has launched her well a long time ago how many clothing lines uh, collections do you have now and the shirt that she's wearing she designed and made um, you're in source of inspiration for me um, but you all are the fact that that you all come like I said is what uh, what allows us to do this and allows us to speak out and, and allows you know for me to keep doing these things and so so thank you so much and again thank you to my sponsors and my sponsors are not just sponsoring me to be here but they're mentors to me they're coaches to me I share things with them and um, they they champion me on so thank you for being the super cool humans that you are thank you and thank you for you guys coming <laughs>